All right, so no public here to comment on anything else. So what do we have for zoning? Um, so uh, as you all may remember, there are a couple of things that sort of were still hanging out there in the residential zoning after um, it went through the adoption process. One of them was to come back and look at URA again and how, what might make sense in terms of potential remapping or um, uh, um, other zoning changes related to urban residential aid to sort of balance the um, distribution um, of units and sort of the issue about fairness from some um, neighborhood neighbors and neighborhoods in the urban residential B and C districts versus um, those neighborhoods that are similarly situated but only in a different zoning classification. Um, so this is really just sort of a marked up plan as a starting point to just put out on the table and have a discussion about um, what might make sense to initiate a process, uh, public, you know, outreach and meetings about um, where to go as sort of next steps. So we just literally took the map um, of all the A, B, and C districts. So urban residential C is the um, green around downtown, and then there are these pockets here. This is um, Barrett Street and King Street here, and this is the. Um, urban residential C that was just redone last year, Hampshire Heights yeah. and um, mm -hmm. Hathaway Farm, I think it's right. called now. Yeah. And then across the way is that condominium project that abuts the Barrett Street Marsh um, mm -hmm. that escapes me. Pheasant. 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 Run or something like that. Yeah. Um, this is River Run that got rezoned to urban residential C. And then this is that um, apartment complex off of Cook Mm -hmm. Avenue and Hatfield Street, that intersection across, sort of behind the Walmart Plaza. Yeah. So those are all the C districts. Purple, um, or periwinkle, or whatever color you want to <laughs> call it, is um, urban residential B. So um, this is uh, Route 9, basically, and that, well, actually, Route 9 here, and then this is the bike path rail trail here. Um, and this area here is around Cooley Dickinson. Hospital. I guess this is Cooley Dickinson. This is the medical um, mm -hmm. uh, DPW. Sorry, um, just beyond that on Route 9, and this white area is Lawrence Center, which is um, General Business District for the most part. There's some industrials there, um, and then the rose color is urban residential A, and um, so these spots here are just. Um, explain these aberrations. This is sort of at the edge of the water supply protection district and that boundary is so funky because it's based on watersheds. So um, these lines were drawn in this way for the most part. So there's this little piece that's not in the watershed area. So it's not in that water supply protection or suburban residential district. And the same um, can be said for this. Um, so it's left because that whole area was URA you guys rezoned it to Watershed's new district. Mm -hmm. water, yeah, water supply. Yeah. What, what name one of the streets that's in? Well, this is Ryan Road right mm -hmm. here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is Route 66 mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. And Florence Road right here. Mm -hmm. So it's so a little triangle. Um, <clears throat> and then here is uh, West Farms Road. Well, is that Winterberry or something like that? Also? Oh, uh, Winterberry, oh, over here is yeah. Wood Circle. I mm -hmm. think. It's what? Wood Circle is right here that runs right mm -hmm. through this. And then I forget what one of these other side streets is. I think this is. Summers uh, Road? I can't remember the name of this street that comes up here. Here's the Ryan Road School. Um, here's Cardinal Way right here. So it's sort of between Cardinal Way and. Um, Where's Ryan Road? Right here. So this is this is Woods Road to Howard Cope subdivision. Right. Oh, that's Woods Road. Okay, and then there's Woods Circle too. Yeah, no, it's on different yeah, circle. Big circle. Yeah. Oh, Brookside. Brookside yeah. Circle. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so that's Woods Road. This is Cardinal Way. So um. Oh, okay. 
And this piece again, so here's Ryan Red School. This is Sawmill Hill um, Conservation Area right here. Mm -hmm. And then this is like Matthew Drive right there. And that's a revolver club right here. Right here, or down here, I guess. Yeah, right here. So this is not even on a street. These are just sort of back parcels. Again, sort of sandwiched between <laughs> the Water Supply Protection District and um, suburban residential. And then this is permanently protected farms, forests, and rivers, which are only assigned now to city-owned conservation areas. So this big piece is part of the Solomon Hills Conservation Area. Um, and then up here, this is off of this is Chesterfield Road here, and um, Reservoir. Reservoir Road. Uh, and then this is. Um, Spring Street continuing on mm -hmm. into um, this is the country club Amazing. and golf course um, and uh, the condominium there. So um, these are all pretty much built out single family house lots. <clears throat> and then Leeds Center is sort of right here. Mm -hmm. um, Water Street is where Urban Residential B is. And then this is on the other side. Uh, Leeds School is basically right here. Mm -hmm. And then this is the Melnick development up there off of Chestnut. Um, and this is Route 9 right here. Um, and then this little URA here is uh, right past the, across the street from the post office, right? Yeah. yeah, so this is River Road. Right. And that's just a little area there. And <coughs> what's all the white? <laughs> The white is everything else. <laughs> so, and where we, so our markup here just indicates options or things we're throwing out on the table as possible rezoning, remapping, so uh, modifying the zoning. <laughs> and you're a lot saying of this is, is what is. This, this is what is. is. This is right. what is. And the okay. markup is what we've thought is sort of the first cut, and we wanted to, okay. you know, throw it out on the table for you guys to think about. And you know, rationalize what our thinking was, and to see if mm -hmm. you guys were on the same page, and if you wanted to move that forward. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some of it is we've um, suggested zoning based on the, what they abut, right. what the district abuts, um, and so that's what um, a lot of this is. So, I don't know if you want to, you know, if we start at one end of town and move yeah. across. Is uh, that yeah. Where? Um, if, if I were just, as I almost am, a citizen off the street looking at this, I would think this is the most gerrymandered, you know, hodgepodge of things. So you're used to looking at it, but what I'm wondering is what do you think has guided it so far? Is it density? Is That's it the problem with URA. You, so the vision to the extent that was a vision in the 70s when, when the zoning came in was really just you get less and less dense. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, and now I think we're probably close to a vision of sort of an urban area and a non-urban area. And so URA doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's not urban and it's not really not urban. Area. So um, could you say um, URA is the most dense? Like, can you, can you, if you're using the, the definition? Middle, we, we have five zoning districts. Mm -hmm. URC, URB, URA, suburban residential, and rural residential. Yeah. And URA is exactly in the middle. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and URA, half of it, for the most part, was wrong because it should be denser and half was wrong because it was in really sensitive environmental areas. Uh -huh. So you got rid of a huge amount of URA when you said, let's make this water supply, mm -hmm. and got stricter. Mm -hmm. There's some places where it's floodplain, you've gotten rid of So individual pieces you've been whittling away for years. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that make sense to look gerrymandered because that's what the streams went to. That's what, you know, so there's natural gerrymandering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are places that are really silly, and some of you who are on the planning board remember one of those controversial things, but. There are some areas, like this, this area of URA, which is up against, it's, you know, a tiny island. That's Round Hill um, yes. Road area, mm -hmm. on Crescent yeah, Street. Right. Mm -hmm. when, when, when you say URA, I think um, Langworthy Road, you know, right. Mrs. Right. What's-Her-Name. Uh, <laughs> well, Langworthy Road doesn't really make all the sense. And, and that's, and that's what, and where one of these are. Right. Yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. So, so in some ways, <laughs> these are the easier arguments. I mean, when, you notice it gets messier and messier as we move out. So at least when we were brainstorming, the places that are totally surrounded by denser areas, it seemed like it had a more of a compelling logic. And the places really surrounded by very, not very dense, it was compelling. I think we struggled the most with leads, frankly. And part of my feeling starting this is, 
we just get totally rid of URA. And I think in the end we said, well, maybe it makes sense in Leeds. Because Leeds, Leeds is one of the few areas that's really been built out to that density. You know, right. one of the logics for the big zoning change you guys all supported was the city was in fact denser than the zoning setting. It was. So we had a lot mm -hmm. of non Leeds, I'm sure, is some of those, but a lot less. For the most part, Leeds, and to a lesser extent, this area was really developed for that kind of zone. Where is that that you just came So there's Fox Farms Road, yeah. the area yeah. sort of north of downtown Florence. Yeah. Um, and it's, but it's bounded basically by the bridge road. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this area incidentally used to be, I think, URA, and we got rid of it a few years ago because it was part of Hatfield's water supply. So that made sense to get rid of that. It was one. WSP, so then there was that little finger that went up here that remained URA because it wasn't in the resource area. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if the URA were taken away, would it, it just take it away? The consequences for the spaces that now are that would be to make some of them more dense and some of them less dense? If you're doing what we were saying, yes. So basically, from Florence to downtown, in every single case, we're suggesting making it your B. So more dense. Right, right. Right. So these are th the very same people who were hollering about the changes that we were going to make on in town are going to end up being... Those people you heard from were actually you lived in URB or URC. They or did live in URB. And they, okay. in fact, were concerned that we weren't treating URA the same way okay. that we were looking right. at okay. B and C. We, we did go, just so you know, because this is territory we were beaten up on before, there was a zone and some of you were on the board for I know Frandy was a camera for you were, to do some of these things before. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of opposition. And we ended up, because it wasn't support, withdrawing these sections. It wasn't going out there, but it was trying to do the same mm -hmm. thing for these sections. And in fact, made some major changes. So, sort of from our standpoint, we got 80% of what we were suggesting mm -hmm. and gave up to the 20%. But mm -hmm. it's been there, and as Carolyn said, there have been some people all along who said, who were frustrated in the other direction, by saying, we're, we're willing to live in this greater density because that's what sustainability means, mm -hmm. but how can you do that without looking at those and then, and just to remind um, people, the um, urban residential C is the mo allows the most residential density other than the central business district or the general business district uh, above the first floor. But so your C allows any kind of multifamily, and it's always sort of been that way up to the um, you know the size cap, the cap based on your lot size. Urban residential B allows up to a three-family. Um, unless you're doing a side-by-side -side sort of townhouse configuration where you don't have one unit on top of the other, but you have side-by-side -side units. And then urban residential A has always just been single-family homes. Mm -hmm. No other units except for, for the last 10 or 15 years, you can do an accessory apartment within a single-family home anywhere in the city. Um, but that's it. So you have these urban residential A areas right next to um, C and B where you do allow multifamily, but within these mm -hmm. pink areas, yeah. only single family. Yeah. And so you heard in some of those, there, you know, there's particularly um, at least one or two residents from Langworthy saying, you can't change our zoning because our deed says we're not allowed to do more than a single family home anyway. But that's not really what zoning Therefore, and you know, I guess there's a question about whether the deed would still stand 40 years later after it was created. Hmm. Um, so, so at any rate, you know, based on that this, that whole conversation that you guys had over the last couple of years, and and people saying, well, yes, we believe in, in sustainability, but you got to really look at the bigger picture. This is sort of the time now to come back and revisit urban residential A um, in that context. Um, so. So do you, do you want to walk us through and, and, yeah. and show areas that what exists now and what you recommend? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's A over there? Well, why don't we there? start here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> the the <laughs> yeah. So this is um, Damon Road. Uh, and <laughs> industrial yeah. drive here, and this is Route 9 um, across the mm -hmm. bridge, uh, across the river. Mm -hmm. um, that's so a strange piece of property. It's very strange. Um, Actually, I should say this is 91, the fat mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. Damon Road, mm -hmm. yeah. the skinny line, 
Yep. And so sandwiched in between mm -hmm. yep. 91 the and Damon Road, there's some houses. Right. And um, I wonder about those every time I go by there. It doesn't really make, so if we start on that side of the road, which is would be the west side, I guess, of Damon Road, you know, it's not really viable residential use, but yet commercial use is, could also be problematic given turning movements and the volume of traffic that's on Damon Road. So we've, and in fact, we've had calls from a property owner who owns several, they're, they're one or two property owners, potentially a third. Are you guys recording? Mm -hmm. I was told to check and make sure. <laughs> Are you we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, there are a couple of property owners, I think, that own the whole string. So wow. in, in that sense, it kind of, it might give a good opportunity to create a zoning, but based on a development agreement where we limit the total number of access points onto Damon Road to one at the t such time that it makes sense to convert from a residential use to a commercial use. Because mm -hmm. I don't think in any scenario you can imagine that someone's gonna, gonna, gonna want to use that for residential. So I think right. that's... Well, unless it was apartments over something, which they've got on this, the right. end back this way. Right. But even so, you know, by the time you get up, you're right over 91. Oh, yeah, so, well. Um, mm. So anyway, it's because we've had interest from the property owners, we've, we've sort of put out the idea to them that, you know, if they can get together, so if there are two of them that own the four parcels. On both sides of the street. No, just on one side, we're talking the about the west, west side. side. You not, know, the, not the used car dealer. Right, now that's and there's a house commercial there. already, right? And there's yeah. a house down there. There's at least yeah. one house, if yeah. not two, on so that side one, of the street as well. Right. There's one house that's part of that car dealership that's actually partially within the road right away. And then there's three houses that are surrounded on three sides by the conservation area that are on fill. And so someday, frankly, we'd like to buy oh, those houses and yeah. take out the fill and restore the conservation right. area. Damon Place or Plaza or something? Where where is that? So I think we just changed hands recently. Yeah. So that's right in the curve so, mm -hmm. over yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. And that's commercial already. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so it's, it's just beyond this okay. stretch. Okay. So where's the river run? The green. The green. Okay. So um, the idea is sort of maybe set that aside, and that could uh, that probably is more likely to be a commercial zoning. Mm -hmm. But um, with a development agreement that stipulates exactly how the site could be built out so that it doesn't yeah. create more congestion yeah. and, and um, traffic like problems. Yeah. Um, the other side, as Wayne uh, mentioned, um, you know, there's some pieces that make sense to add ultimately to the conservation area. So F, that's what FFR is. is mm -hmm. Sort of thinking about that because that's really on the really close to the floodplain and just drops off right now. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you yeah. foresee that having a frontage road? Is that how you would, I mean, when you're saying you, the property owners might get together and have a single entrance? I think not for a real frontage road, but just a common driveway that serves okay. the whole property. Kind of like the like successful <laughs> development of the street. All that thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Right. laughs> but this time we do it the right way up. Yeah. <laughs> So does that make sense for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then the next piece here, this is to the east of Barrett Street Marsh. It's very, and then there's, this is Carlin Drive right here. So there's this little sliver of urban residential A, and across the way, backing up to the backside of the Blue Bonnet strip mm -hmm. along King Street, is um, a little cul-de-sac with that's built out as residential, and that's urban residential B. So um, this, um, again, so we're basically suggesting to match what's across the street mm -hmm. instead of urban residential A. There's two homes there. Mm -hmm. One, and as it is now, it definitely makes sense to be U or B. There is one other option for the home on the corner. There's a home that's on the corner of Carlin Drive and Barrett Street. Mm -hmm. And from Barrett Street, it absolutely makes sense to be residential. From Carlin Drive, it sort of makes sense to be commercial. And there's a woman who's interested in that. And we suggested there is a different development agreement, which is it's actually a thin sliver she has to buy to get to Barrett to <coughs> Carlin Drive. But we suggested if she'd frontage off Carlin Drive and then put a 30-foot buffer 
between her and the residential on Barrett Street. Mm -hmm. So she felt more like Crawling Drive, then right. it makes sense to go to business. She needs to figure out, is her property worth anything if she in fact had a 30 foot buffer? There may be nothing left. Right. But that's at least, that might be logical. Mm -hmm. What's the white around that area? What is it? Conservation, because that's the, this is the Bear Street Marsh okay. right here. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is commercial on this side, because yeah. this is King Street here. So it's commercial up to about this point where the marsh is. Okay. And then all of this here is Looks like a Bear Street continuing on, and then um, it gets piped under these um, parcels at Front King Street. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Okay, mm -hmm. so then we come up to, this is the bike path, um, this is Barrett Street, um, Jackson Street School is right here, um, so the, bi the uh, bike path comes through here. This is Ridgewood Terrace, um, and do I have all my, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so this part here is sort of that corner of Barrett and Jackson Street that's on the east side. And there's a lot of wet area actually that drains to the Barrett Street Marsh. But there's some open fields in here that have just, mm -hmm. the, there's a farmer here. But, uh, what's his name? I see the guy. There's a question. Oh, check. Oh, check. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that's been on the market for a while for the, the right price you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, I mean, we're just suggesting, uh, you know, starting with this corner, urban residential B, because both sides are B, the school side and this whole neighborhood by the Jackson Street School is B. It has, you know, close yeah, access, access to the things in that area. Right, right. and these, these are apartments here, which is why it's C. This is um, Hampshire Heights nice. again, yeah. and, and um, Hathaway Farm. So where do you see this, this side this boundary side? defined as what? B as well. So this actually is Child's Park. So this is this whole area from Ridgewood Terrace. This is Prospect, mm -hmm. right. Prospect Street. Mm -hmm. This is at North Elm Street. Uh -huh. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's uh, Cooley Dickinson right. and Whitewood. This yeah. is Cooley Dickinson. Yeah. So that's so North Elm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, sort of the bike path coming through here. So on both sides, all around, is all urban residential B, except this is commercial here, general business, or neighborhood business, actually. Including, this is the um, funeral home right here in the corner. And what's in the middle of it? This? Mm -hmm. right That's there. Child's Park. Uh, no, under your, oh. Uh, this park. whole okay. thing. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I was, this I was looking at it from such a slant, the URB label in the middle looked like lavender to me. <laughs> So, and this is um, Prospect, this is Woodlawn right here. So there, this whole row of homes here along Woodlawn is urban residential A, but everything behind it and all around it is B. Yeah. Um, and then there's some larger parcels that just have single family homes up here on the west side of Jackson Street School that are A. How did that happen over time to have a URB island in that area? I think it probably goes back to um, just that they were mostly single-family homes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm guessing. And, yeah. uh, just, none of us were here in 74, but reverse engineering it seems like they were just freezing in time exactly what they had. Right. It wasn't right. a real plot. Wasn't right. that what the zoning was essentially? Right. Just sort of looking at what it was and trying to make it conform with what was already there? Yeah, except that we had the fact that URC was really down, though. URC yeah. Was less, 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 less. But I think you're well, right. Well, and URA, I mean, they all were, really. They, they still created big right, lot right. sizes mm -hmm. in the 70s. They were 20,000. That's right. Square foot we lot. changed those lot sizes so. over the years. But yeah, <laughs> what is the, um, uh, say, I own a home in that area now, and it changes. Uh -huh. And it goes from A to B. What's the consequence? So what that what would be. What's that mean in my daily life? Mm -hmm. I have is, a mortgage, you know, I'm going to live there for 20 years. Yeah. So right now, you're allowed to have an accessory apartment in one of these single family homes. I guess what it would mean is you could potentially have a full two family instead of a, an accessory apartment, um, which means you're not restricted to the size. So an accessory apartment can't be more than a 900 square foot unit. Um, 
and an owner is required to live in one of the units under that provision of the ordinance if you're an accessory apartment. If you're a two family, you don't have those restrictions. Um, you can rent both units. They can be any size. One doesn't necessarily have to be um, smaller or accessory to the other one. And it can be a three family. And you can be up to a three family if you have the right number, the lot size. Right now, um, URA, as it was rezoned in August, is 5,000 square feet per unit. Actually, it didn't print out A, what do you know? Um, <clears throat> So it's one unit for 5,000 square feet. So if you didn't do anything to the code, you need 10,000 square feet for a two-family. So Unless think about that area and tell me if there are those lots in that area. You mean that Scott House is all over area, now? Yeah, yeah. There, you would be able, there are some larger lots that you would be able to fit. So if you went to URB, sorry, it's yeah. one unit per 2,500. So you need 5,000 square foot lot to do, two fam to do a two-family. And to do a three-family, you need 7,500 square feet. You know, because, I mean, aren't some of those lots along Prospect really deep? So that they would have... On Prospect? Uh, Prospect and Prospect's yeah. Park? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, across from Childs Park? Yeah, like yeah. along, uh, like between yeah. Jackson yeah. And, the height and, the, and the hospital. Oh, right. There's some really deep, yeah. There are a couple and well in Woodlawn, too. Woodlawn. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the other thing about that, though, is those houses are also set way back. So I don't know that you could... Not the ones on Prospect. Okay. The ones that run, yeah. you know, that runs up to the hospital, or whatever. But they're they go all the way back to the bike path. I mean, they go pretty far back. Well, no, those actually, if you're fronting Prospect, they're not that deep. Mm -hmm. But if you're on Jackson Street, there are a couple of really big, larger, deep mm -hmm. lots that go um, west. Oh, okay. So there may be some development opportunity that's not there now under a URA scenario. Mm -hmm. um, the park obviously is never going to change, right. so it's not going to. That's you know. At first glance, like I love the feel of Woodlawn and Child's Park, and it just feels very gentrified. If that's the correct use of that word, and you know, it's it's far enough from downtown that I don't. I'd, I'd like to hear a case made for density there, but that that's only a part of it. So I can also see more of um, Jackson Street. Uh, I think is uh -huh. more, um, you know, along the back uh, bike path. I think is more conducive to density. Um, I just I would hate to lose that that sort of feel you get around Child's Park. Yeah, I mean, I'm not so sure because those lots are built out. Mm -hmm. I don't think there would be a lot of change unless someone were to tear down and build uh -huh. a new modern Start home over. Right, right. <laughs> on um, Woodlawn and start over. Mm -hmm. But you know that's probably pretty far and few between. Um, I, I could see where someone might add a unit to their house. Those are deeper lots, so mm -hmm. you could probably do something that's fairly invisible. And the fact that it is so walkable, you've got the Y there, you've got the high school, mm -hmm. you know, and the open mm -hmm. space along the Middle River. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that the character of that street would necessarily change by adding an apartment unit to the back of one of those houses, or and, but they can do that under current zoning. Not URA no, no. doesn't allow anything other except for an accessory apartment. You could still do an accessory apartment, but it's you could do yeah. right, yeah. right. That has to be incorporated as part of the initial building. The accessory no, it could sit do, in the back. We actually do allow detached mm -hmm. accessory mm -hmm. apartments. Mm -hmm. Um, is that true for any area? Any district. Detached area. versus special permit. Okay. Right. But it's allowed. Yeah, so yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do. I, I, I think I understand, and that's kind of where it's going. But, but also, I don't know. It does seem. I mean, I, I can see where the idea of having these islands kind of. I don't know. It doesn't. Well, in, in one sense, I'm swayed by the map, but. The example that really hits me is we're a, we're a community that's getting older, and, yeah. and for people to have to sell their house in order to make a lifestyle change yeah. is is really what could come out of this. I want people to be able to, you know, take the existing structure, and I'm 
we did this through the previous zoning. Yeah. The cost of tearing these down to rebuild one to get a more dense unit is not really what's going to happen. Right. You're going to, you're going to, I mean, they can, but the right. cost right. of. I mean, think about an example. I mean, in terms of sort of the beautiful big homes, your neighbor off South Street, Elm Street, Round Hill, mm -hmm. those have been URB for years, mm -hmm. and it's not that we've seen those places suddenly being bastardized. No, right? what you, you are seeing is more people living in the same structure. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Or actually, fewer people than it was 20 years ago, but just two units. Because there's two couples on each side instead of yeah. one family yeah. of six kids. Don't let any of them have kids. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, an example of this sort of, the corner of, uh, right now it's a single family home, but the house on the corner of Woodlawn and Prospect and um, Elm oh. was on the market several years ago for a long time, and um, it's a it's a big house. I don't remember what sort it's of a it is. It's, it's a stucco, yeah. yeah. right? Yeah. And for a while, there was a nonprofit that was looking at it because nobody could figure out how to occupy this huge house. Mm -hmm. And there are other homes on Woodlawn that are like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think. You know, had there been an option, and then there are a couple more around the corner, right there, that are still on Elm, that are in, um, you know, there are actually a couple of big mansions on that end of Elm yeah, that are yeah. urban residential A, mm -hmm. and they're just they're enormous structures. Right. So I think that those won't change, but maybe the the flexibility to use them could they be might better. go in, into duplexes. Right. Mm -hmm. So really, we should use the same reasoning for the for the major zoning changes when we're looking at, at this map. And I'm just curious why this was left alone when the, the big push for, for the zoning changes was... It's really sort of, there's a, there's, there's a trying to find a balance between doing everything so we tie them all together mm -hmm. and getting so overwhelmed and that getting nobody something done. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But I mean, I think ultimately <coughs> the map should reflect they should converge at some point to, to almost mirror each other. And it seems, in a general sense, you'd have URC close to downtown, URB in the middle, and you trend to URA and Leeds. Mm -hmm. Leeds is kind of in the middle. It feels that way anyway. You know, so switching that to URB, you know, to me it makes sense maybe URA out in Leeds, but in this area, though, though I love the feel of Woodlawn and the look and so forth, it seems to me you, you, if you're gonna Go to this effort. You change Child's Park to F, what is it, FFR, and yeah. and and everything else to URB because that's mm -hmm. what's all around it on every side, and that's where you'd want more, not crazy, but more density the closer you are to downtown. Any other thing that's compelling? Go around Ch Child's Park. Okay, so the A is on, goes all the way around it, including across from the. Well, no, the high school is. The, the, the high school is B. And the one road that goes through there is, is at the edge. Right. Woodlawn goes right along the edge here. Route 9. This is Route 9, sorry. Right, so it's right along the yeah. edge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is Prospect here. And where's Massasoit? Uh, right there. Yeah. And here's Franklin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is another sort Franklin. of compelling thing. When you think about yeah. Franklin and Massasoit, they, yeah. they look just like the ones further out. I mean, mm -hmm. the, there's no real difference, and they're in different zones. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, one of the compelling things for me for this and the zoning change you guys just did is, you know, for 20 years we've been reducing lot size in these urban core areas um, and, and allowing more and more flexibility. And every census we look at, the population continues to drop. So yeah. mm -hmm. family size is, is dropping faster than we can do it. So it's mm -hmm. not that any of these going to create more people in these areas. It might create more units, so maybe the drop in population is slower. Well, and the population projections for the city for the next. 15 years certainly is down, not right. up. For any organization. Well, another thing you have to consider on, on previous zoning attempts is who, which city council lived in which zoning. Yeah, I, I yeah. wondered when I first and saw and this. And it's something to worry it. about in the future, too, because yeah. certainly any attempts to change URA was uh, in serious trouble with previous attempts. Mm -hmm. So going back to Carlos' question, but that would only happen if, in fact, people tore down and then re. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if it was just subdividing the current structures, right, or adding be, a piece in the back. Obviously, there'd be more cars, yeah. but I mean, it wouldn't. It wouldn't change the feel of it as much as if, you know, they tore down and you know they put. In you know, fact, you could say this could be an effort to preserve the housing. Right. Opposed, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, that's what we talked about during the, you know, that initial zoning mm -hmm. is give people some opportunity to have 
income back by, you know, if they're spending to preserve the mm -hmm. character of the historic structure, that costs a lot of money. Right. Well, and to recap why you didn't do it before, we changed the rules for the zoning areas, but it's a really big deal to also change the map of the right. zone at the same mm -hmm. time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it would have felt like we were, I think it would have felt like we were up to too much because people couldn't quite figure out what it meant right. to their each plot. Right. So I, I I understand separating this. And in layman's terms, you know, someone said, "Well, what are you doing?" I mean, could we make the case that we're giving home current homeowners a chance to have more flexibility for lifestyle, aging in place, you know, all those things by by making this change. Well, yeah. and for some particular properties, like the very large mansion right, you described, yeah. especially they, those, yeah. you actually breathe new life into them right. Right. In, a, in a sale. Right. Yeah, I mean, everybody wants their own property rezoned, and nobody wants a neighbor's property yeah. rezoned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. Well, I think we made a good case to change it. So, I mean, the same holds, really. This is, um, this is, Ward Avenue right here. So these, they have really long, deep lots going to the river. This is, um, or is it federal or Berman? It's federal. This is federal down. here. Vernon, this is yeah. um, Vernon, I guess, yeah. here. And then Washington comes down here, so there's an access to the river mm -hmm. here. This is Yeah, Maynard and Forbes don't James. reach all the way to Ward Avenue. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. They, so um, there's this whole area. Now, we just, um, the, the reason why it has a wavy line here is this is the floodplain boundary. Mm -hmm. So all the houses are at the top of the hill, mm -hmm. but their lots actually go mm -hmm. really oh, deep really? down. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. like 40 yeah. feet down. Yeah. Yeah. They have yeah. Yeah. great big gardens. That's oh. what I've yeah. seen down there is yeah. big gardens. Mm -hmm. so, so, and they're very narrow. Uh, you know, if you bend down there, the houses are um, close together. But it's the same thing. You know, you've got these old, larger, older homes. So. When, when you're figuring out what can go on in a lot, and you need 5,000 square feet to do a two-family, uh, and but part of my lot is in floodplain. What happens? Mm -hmm. It still counts as your lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Area. Um, unless it's underwater, then we don't. <laughs> um, it's not my land anymore, is it? If it's in the Mill River? <laughs> <laughs> so in effect, you know, the watershed is like a sixth zone. Than, I mean, in the feel of the... No, not at all. The sixth, zone number six. I mean, it's another... You know, all the way down in the effect, it's so another one. Yeah. 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 Well, well, right. yeah. I didn't know that all the way down in the five primary residential districts. Then there is the more supply, there's more back. Oh, and then I mean, I thought it was like an overlay, but it's not. I know you remember. I'd only seen it from Randy. I know you remember. Yeah, but I didn't realize that the lots and all the way back. I don't remember anything. So this wraps around, this is Dryad's Green here. So this west, south, same thing. It just sort of wraps all the way around to, I guess, Dryad's Green is sort of the point where it converts to urban residential. B and then this is Kensington, right? Kensington, Kensington yeah. is half B and half C. C being Smith College. C right. being Smith College. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what that is. And then over here we talked about this is Langworthy, that little step street that backs up to the back side of the Clark, former Clark campus. Um, so you can only access it coming off of Crescent Street. Mm -hmm. And then it's a little dead end street. Um, and then if you go further up Crescent, this is Bancroft. So all of Bancroft and the lots fronting it going up and around Round Hill on the back side of the Clark campus are A. So, and then you can see it's clearly sandwiched between C and, and B there. So what's the white? That that's little a, lot that's a reserve that at the bottom. Mary Brown, yeah. Uh, yeah, conservation area. So it's a little. Uh, it's almost landmark. Below so Crescent before, and Prospect back in there. You, there's a, you uh, know that little Franklin Street that comes? Yeah. Or, that no, wait, Glendale, Court. Glendale Avenue yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. The dead ends yeah. off of Prospect okay. down by Summer Street, somewhere in that, or Winter Street, I guess. Mm. Right across there, that dead ends into the end of that. Uh, mm. the Bears list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the belly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to me, those, those, the little ones seem, mm -hmm. you know, it just seems to make sense. I mean, mm -hmm. and the larger one is, yeah. is a little bit, but I mean, the little ones seem, but I, you know, the one's in your neighborhood, so you might, have, you might have a different the, view. <laughs> the Barrett Street around behind Clark School again. 
Um, Bancroft? Uh-huh, Bancroft. Okay, there. so Sorry. this starts at um, Franklin. It's a, a street that connects Franklin and crosses Crescent, and then starts to go up the hill. It's pretty steep there. And um, if you look through the trees, you can see the back side of Clark Campus. And you're coming up around the hill, and it intersects with is that Bancroft or Hillside? That's Bancroft. So your bend part where it connects with Round Hill is sort of halfway down Round Hill going mm -hmm. towards Prospect. Um, and Are there some empty lots in there? No. Bancroft. In, the in, the in the blue there are some? No. Oh, there are some lots that go, you're right, there's a couple lots that go from Bancroft to Hillside, right? They have double right. frontage. Mm -hmm. So it's not empty lot per se, but it could be divided up. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. It so hasn't got a house If you're on Hillside, uh -huh. yeah. it looks like there's an empty space yeah, right. on Hillside. But in mm -hmm. fact, it's the backyard of, of, the, mm -hmm. of Hillside. And, and with the zoning change, making a lot smaller, that's more true now than it was before. So those could potentially... There those be could be some, some development. Right. right. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, right. uh, Just, and so with the change, it could be developed as multifamily. Well, the uphill side that's urban residential A, so the downhill side, which is already been is zoned B, and has a smaller lot size, potentially could go now as right. a mm -hmm. as a building lot. Um, but with two potentially two families, but not the uphill side. And the uphill side is already built out. So you could potentially add a unit, but it also depends on those setbacks. So some of those mm -hmm. houses don't meet their setbacks, so it may not. It may be impossible mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, I went over some places. You know, we do have some fires every year, and there's a few places that are in bad shape and get tore down. So there will be some tear down. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Okay. Should we keep moving? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this block is north of Florence Center, which is right here. Um, this is Chestnut. This is Bridge Road? Yes, this is Bridge Road. This is Chestnut. Is that correct? So this um, is like Strawberry Hill. And yeah, this is the Vernon Street, um, right? That's why it's white, right? The other bar? That's the landfill? Yeah, so Garfield. Vern Garfield, right. Oh. And Verona, right. Oh. So, Not Vern yeah, Ver I was thinking of Verona. Oh, right? okay. it, yeah. <laughs> so this is Chestnut. Um, this crossroad is, oh my god, is this That's something strawberry. I don't know? Strawberry. Is that strawberry? Strawberry. No, yeah, straw is right here. Oh, okay. In the, and Route 9 is where? Uh, right here through this floor. That's right. Yeah. And this is the bike this path. This is Bridge Road. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's so Bridge that Road. So that's Fitzgerald's Fence Road. Yeah. 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 And um, so this, there's, Okay, I should know this because oh no, over here. So this edge, this is Hillcrest. Mm -hmm. This is something, something, something. And Chestnut. So who is it? Fox that? Farms? Maybe it's Fox Farms. It is, yeah. So the so obviously it's surrounded by B, so it might logically look like B. The interesting thing is that this this whole area that's B now, we actually have an appeal coming forward because there's, there are these funky lots in here on the B side that have access to a street that goes through here, this Kimball. Mm -hmm. But because there's not enough lot size to, and frontage in B, this person a long time ago bought a lot in Hillcrest and that made their lot whole essentially for compliance. Now they're trying to sell off, or they have sold off the Hillcrest one, trying to develop it, but we're saying because it's A zoning and it, um, you can't subdivide the parcel off. So, oh. so I, I'm just bringing this up because if the zoning were to change to URB, it would create a little bit more flexibility in this one instance, but also it, it sort of represents the problem of having sort of split districts within a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking about this very neighborhood in the zoning discussions mm -hmm. about how different pockets of the city just didn't make any sense and this was one of them yeah. where there's no difference between you know this street and the adjoining street or the one next to it after that and yet they're different you know one's a one's b for no reason that anybody was aware of um, and, and then the triangle that comes 
this one. Yeah. So this is, yeah, these are all pretty tight, dense, yeah. you know, dense mm -hmm. neighborhood here mm -hmm. built in the, what, 60s? Um, so, yeah, it just doesn't really match the A sort of concept. Anyway, I think those are pretty much built out, um, but, you know, I guess it... What, what is this area here? This is... Rick Drive is here. What's um, the zone here? Is that, or is that that's where part of the line. Yeah. Yeah. And that little triangle's not... Right, because the line of the drain, the drainage uh, line runs that way. This is all Fitzgerald Lake conservation right. area. Yeah. This is Fitzgerald Fence property, but right. here right. is Fitzgerald Lake. Um, so the, the, the area of um, um, direction of flow and watershed goes the other way, and this just happens to be the dividing line. Mm -hmm. And the same with this. That's why this line comes across yeah. here. Funny looking line. Yeah. Yeah. And right. that's where the mills were. And yeah, right here. And then this is the neighborhood right, right next to this. And this is Spring Grove um, Cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we were suggesting same, you know, mm -hmm. be here. Now this is... Yeah, so uh, Bridge Road continues here, um, and then this is the VA right, right. here, yeah. um, and this is the park. park. So we would propose that to be FFR, not a mental, obviously. And the little cute little bumps going mm -hmm. floodplain. So <laughs> this is the mapped floodplain here, mm -hmm. and then it was just um, so it had previously been an overlay. Mm -hmm. And over, then URA. over URA. Over yeah. URA. Mm -hmm. So when we took the floodplain out of there, mm -hmm. these little bump okay, out so there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I've got are totally symbolic. That land is landlocked. You couldn't get to it. Right. It's never going to be developed. But we might as well clean this up. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the, the development there next to the middle school, uh, Bear Hill. Yeah. Right there, right? Right. And that's permitted, that's, built, you know. But it's not built out. I mean, I thought there was still more. There are, but I mean, I suppose you could come back and amend the permit, but then you've got all these condo owners that might not allow that to happen anyway. <laughs> There's I just didn't 10 know what to 12 it, more of them. Yeah, I didn't know what impact it would have, I mean, making this change, given that it, it, right. theoretically it's not complete. Well, actually, the other piece of it, though, is it did come in as a cluster development, mm. and there are some significant to topographic constraints that limited the number of units mm. they could do anyway. Okay. So I'm not really sure that could ever have more than what's there. Even if all the homeowners now would allow it, mm -hmm. um, there's just the topography probably. Right. Yeah. And they got the VA behind them. Right. right. Um, so the other interesting thing about this is we had this overlay all, all along this north side of Bridge Road, which includes these areas that we're talking about, where you could increase your density under a cluster provision anyway to a URB density mm. if you provided affordable housing unit. So it's not, I mean, it, in some respects, that provision to get more dense was on the books if you did it through sort of a master plan development process. Um, if you, you know, if, to just add more rationale to that side of the street. Um, so, are we good there? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're on a roll. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Which part first? So, so that's to turn those all into. URB. URB. B. Yeah. None of okay. them into... Except for this would be FFR, which is look par. Okay, and, and no no area in there would, would be taken out and put into the suburban... That's the next no, you're about that's to get the to. Next <laughs> <one>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so then, I just want to say, this has an arrow to FFR, just may as well take on this. This is the golf course. So, we don't have a... We need to make text changes to the current Farms, Forests, and Rivers because it currently just covers conservation land. So we need to modify the text language to say permanently protected land, but still allowing some kind of recreational activity. So like golf courses or like Look Park that has these other functions associated with it. But we know it's not going to be built out as a residential use. It's really there as a recreation. It's somewhat of a recreation now, but it's thinking more like recreation department. As opposed to, oh, yeah, you know, commercial recreation. Yeah, well, like the garden house. We, we're not trying to stop the garden house. We're not sure that's a or 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 <laughs> <laughs> But is the golf course? Could the golf course ever be changed to residential? 
No. Okay. So golf course was a um, planning or development, sort of like a cluster is today. So that golf course is, not all golf courses would be, but that golf course right. is. Just because of that. Right. 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 Okay. So we, if it was an earlier, ver today we require a conservation restriction mm -hmm. people do that. So that doesn't exist there, but just the, the permit mm -hmm. that allowed right. that still applies. If council changed all the zoning, then it could be developed, but mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. So then the other piece of that is the actual condominium complex that um, mm -hmm. was built as part of the mm -hmm. golf course. Um, is it built out? Fairway Village, right? Yeah. Yes, that's yeah, completely that. built out. Yeah. So rezone that to URB because they're, it's a condominium it's project, it's high density. But zone the golf course itself, that piece of it is at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I really need to understand, but I don't know what you just said about the golf course. I, I missed. So the, there, was a, there was a full golf course, 18 whole golf course. They carved out Fairway Village. It was in essence a cluster, different term at the time. Okay. And they, in essence, they carved out Fairway Village and left enough land for, I think it's a nine hole golf course now. I'm not sure about that. But So because the permit basically said you develop half at greater density, you have to preserve the golf course. Okay, thank you. So the permit condition says it protected, no deeds or anything else. Mm -hmm. So it, no matter, transacting that course cannot happen for any other purpose. Until, unless council changed all the zoning. The golf course does allow, the other way to deal with the zoning, the golf course does allow that country club where the pool is, that's a permitted use we need to make sure we're not trying to stop that use. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so then moving across the river um, in the up Chesterfield Road, sort of, um, do you imagine going up Chesterfield Road, there's some farm houses mm -hmm. left, but there's also a little pocket, a little neighborhood there. And then um, south of that are sort of all these flag lots that um, are really low density. So this is where we were suggesting go to suburban residential. Again, this is water supply protection, right? The white part? Uh, to the oh, down east, here is water right. supply. This is SR now, so it would just match that. Makes sense. Um, and um, what's SR? So that doesn't allow any multifamily, it's all single family, lower density. Um, Unless you either, cluster. Right, a 30,000 square foot lot, 125 feet of frontage. Um, so I'll take care of these little pockets here. Um, this, I had mentioned was, oh, um, I was going to, it is Salmon Hills Conservation Area. This we're looking, this is a mistake or we're trying to acquire We just acquired that. a couple years ago. We just acquired ago. that, so that needs to be rezoned. Um, and then the rest of these pieces are landlocked, you know, just left over from the surrounding zone, so go to SR. Um, and the same for this, we talked a little bit about that, but given that the abutting zone is her, I'm not sure. And that fits the comprehensive plan, which basically says that's the area where the term is a conservation development, mm -hmm. not anti housing. We're not looking for a density out there. Most of this is already built out, except there's this pocket in here that is partially, well, there's a ton of wetlands and there are vernal pools. Mm -hmm. So there are constraints anyway relative to development. So you could argue, well, you're sort of down to from urban residential A to mm -hmm. SR, but in fact, Anything that happens in here is going to be part of a cluster development. Um, so that could still happen under SR. Um, and then leads. Um, so bike path coming up here. And this could be, so we're suggesting a change. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to that. Um, but what is why? You're just bailing out on that one? Not <laughs> well, sure. why? I mean, I'd love to get rid of URA totally. In the area I wouldn't have any problem with URB development. But if part of the story of URC is this really short walking distance to downtown, and URB, your reasonable walking distance from some commercial area, Leeds doesn't really have yeah. much of a commercial center. So it's a really part of the area. Yeah. You know, it's not Florence, and it's not downtown. It's there's about three or four commercial buildings down there. There's been nine historic lease center. Way back in Route uh -huh. 9, there's three or four commercial buildings. Yeah. But. And the same goes for that other little mm -hmm. pocket up on River Road. But then you've got blue pockets up there, too. So that was sort of the old mill housing development along got it. Um, Water mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. So they're small. they were zoned that way because there were smaller lots. And so going back to the other in there, the, that you want to leave URA, 
just because I walk there every day. I mean, there are lots of homes that would be, you know, suitable for subdividing, you know, creating, I mean, there's people, they family have pretty big lots. Would not have, changing it prevent them, I mean, or would it just make it more difficult? Some of the bigger lots still could be divided, but yes, would limit the number that could be. Okay. I, mean, I wouldn't be proud. Don't get me wrong, I would have no problem with being URB. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of pre-existing non-conformities. There's not a lot of lots that are already at the URB density. Right. There's not a lot of commercial development, which means we're really pushing it being there. Um, so well, it's just not as compelling. I'm not gonna, yeah, it's not right. bad. I'm just saying about the changes that we just made. Oh, that's true. Did allow you know it's going from 75 feet of frontage to 50 feet of frontage, mm -hmm. and from 12,000 square feet to 5,000 could allow Created some of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you know what comes from for me somewhat, and I, I'm, I don't want to sound classist at this, but in the areas which are really at URB density, to me the people who don't want to change are just about preserving their little area, and that to me isn't the right thing. In that area. If Leeds Civic wants his own to URB, I'd support it in a second. But I'm, just, I'm not sure imposing it is sort of changing. I guess I don't feel comfortable with that. Right. Whereas, yeah, makes sense. Well, there you go. <laughs> no changes. That was one night. It took the other stuff three years. And this is one <laughs> night. <laughs> they still take three years to go through yeah, the process. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is just. I was going to say, you haven't pitched it yet, and in my mind, this is the choir. Um, I, um, I think how it's presented will be really, you know, how well it's presented will be kind of the catch on it. It, it, it does fit a lot of things. It fits the sustainability plan. It makes sense of the zoning changes that we made. It's not as scary because of the population trends. You know, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why it, you know, it ought to go through. We'll see. Well, you know, make sure that the folks that were concerned that we weren't addressing A mm -hmm. along the ride. Right. I mean, ultimately, it's just, it seems to make sense. And so yeah. it's reasonable and thought out and it makes sense. And so I would think it would be well received. Why don't, I, why don't I talk about FFR now? Because it's a lot of math still correct your So this is much more housekeeping. So, so these changes would take a long time to go through the process. Um, and Carol was talking about some areas we want to change to FFR, but only once we change the test. This is just, so, we, so just so you have a quick history of FFR, FFR is created when Governor Will became governor, and he was going to balance the state budget by selling the state hospital. And so the way we got defensive <laughs> is how that work out. <laughs> <laughs> we rezoned the old buildings to be planned village development. We rezoned all the areas we wanted to protect as open space to be arms forest rivers. So basically, the most restrictive zone we could think about. And then cooler heads prevailed, and the legislature protected all the land on those. And so we had this thing on the books for a long time. <laughs> then two years ago, we rezoned all the conservation areas in town. Farms, forests, rivers, Existing. more for truth than advertising. But thinking oh, someday maybe we actually use some private properties in places we don't want development. Farms, forests, rivers, but we have, didn't do that yet. And at the time, we sort of said, we'll come back as we buy more land. So all this is is the green on here are the conservation areas that are already zoned to FFR, and the yellow is the conservation land we've purchased in the last three years. So it's basically we would just add that so it all matches. You see a few funny holes in that, and that's because floodplain zoning, special conservancy, is even stricter. So where there's a floodplain that goes through a conservation land, that remains flood zone floodplain. So for instance, you're talking exactly. about there. Mm -hmm. right. So the Lake is actually yeah. floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and likewise, we own uh, some conservation land in Meadows. Mm -hmm. That doesn't show up because that's zone special conservancy. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, so John asked, you know, why wasn't the Smith Forest on there? And um, I was explaining that we, it's question. not all the parkland and, um, or school lots or things of that sort are on here because they're not, they don't have the same protection and that's a working forest basically, right? So we, it's not in the Right, so there's two reasons it's not there. So one is exactly what Carolyn just said, it's, it's not ours to do and Smith Folk owns it and, 
yeah, they could sell it for homes. But the other is, there is sort of a game we want to play at some point. The state at various points, have, they don't, this doesn't exist right now, but at various points on and off over the years, they'd have programs to fund municipal unprotected land to protect the land. When they will pay the difference between what the land is worth for development and the land is worth for conservation. And I don't want to give that up. So if we rezone at Farms Forest Rivers, then there's no development value left, right. and Smithville wouldn't get half a million dollars. The water supply protection lands by the Leeds Reservoirs are not on here for exactly the same reason. We want to protect that, but we want to give the half a million dollars of state money first, and then we protect it. So would you add to these yellow areas that you want to change to green, would you add yeah. Love Park and Child's Park? Yes, but it's a longer conversation. So I think we might do this as low hanging fruit because yeah. this doesn't require a text change. You know, Collins come and sell it earlier tonight voted to endorse this as well. Okay. I wouldn't want to do a look park until we fix the zoning text to make sure garden house is allowed. Right. And we have a conversation with them about it. Okay. Same thing goes for child. Yeah, that makes sense. We'll come back to you for public hearing when you're voting to sponsor it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we sponsor the uh, changes to zoning map for, for, for farms, forests, and rivers. Second, John. Mm -hmm. All in favor? We need to do the same for that. No, because we're okay. still we're, this is sort of work in progress. Um, okay, so number two. Um, oh, which one should we do first? Um, number two, changes to site plan in the A, B, and C for additional units on a parcel versus accessory permits. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, I guess. So after the zoning change, we sort of we've had a bunch of inquiries about what people might want to do on their lot. So if they have extra land, they might want to add um, another detached structure. So um, really, already? Yeah. Um, are, are these detached structures living quarters, garages? The, um, well, they would either be new or conversion of mm. garages. So the so the requirement is. So what, as part of that whole package, we deleted a section in the zoning that said that prohibited um, more than one principal residential structure on a parcel so that people could get creative and put smaller units in the back of their lots um, and maybe then create compatible design with the neighborhood if there are lots of detached you know, carriage houses or garages. So. Um, and, and we didn't, so there, there was that one piece. Um, we did not prohibit that. We, right, we eliminated the prohibition. So there had been something on the books up to that point that said you can't have more than one principal structure that has a single two or three family unit on it. So you couldn't have two two family homes on one lot or a single unit in one house, in one structure and then another single unit in another structure but on the same parcel. That wasn't allowed until the zoning changed. So, We've been having these inquiries, and the way they've been interpreted is um, that if you have a two-family, for example, on an existing lot, and um, you wanted to um, add another structure, so you might have a lot here, and you have a two-family here, um, and your driveway's here. And then you think, well, I've got enough land area, I've got enough frontage, I'd really like to do a single unit here, but in a detached structure. And I meet all the setbacks from the rear and the side, no problem. Um, from our ordinance, the, the um, definition of a single family house is a single unit in a self-contained structure. So um, this came up because we thought, well, there might be people that um, they want to come in and add this, and, and right now it's, 
it wouldn't, if it's under 2,000 square feet, it wouldn't trigger any site plan review by the planning board. It would just be a new structure in and of itself. Um, but on the other hand, we still have on the books this detached accessory apartment that's allowed anywhere in the city. It can't be more than 900 square feet. It also requires special permit by zoning board of appeals. So we sort of have two scenarios where um, if this is a single family and then over here you might have a smaller lot that doesn't allow you to do another whole other unit but you could do this as an accessory apartment. Um, this is a ZBA special permit. This is nothing. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to come to you guys and say, is that okay not to have site plan review over the addition of one house that might be less than 2,000 square feet? Um, because it wouldn't create more than six parking spaces, which is another trigger for site plan review. And is it okay to have these two, con two seemingly conflicting permit reviews for these two different situations? And I'll add, I guess I, had, I probably switched where I was, but one reason I probably now think it should be site plan approval is when there's a deep lot and their homes along the road in a nice line, neighbors don't usually object when there's suddenly a house in someone's backyard, you know, there's a, there's a, a line of backyards or open space and suddenly someone's there. I'm not saying it's not a good idea to have there, but it should be subject to a greater review. And so I guess thinking about that, you know, a, you might have a detached garage that's 15 or 20 feet at the peak, but if our minimum, a maximum height for a principal structure is 35 feet, your rear structure could be 35 feet instead of sort of more of a diminutive garage kind of height. Mm -hmm. um, do so, need, do you need an occupancy permit for an accessory apartment? Yes. And do you, what what is does that mean that you have to have in the way of services in that unit? Do you have to have plumbing? Yeah, if you're gonna if it's the living space. And the way we define, the way we've sort of looked at accessory apartments is then if there's a second kitchen, um, that sort of would be the trigger that that's really functioning as a second unit. I mean, there are other things too, but when you really start to, if people really start trying to play the game and say, well, this isn't really a separate unit, it does, in some cases, it might boil down to whether or not there's a second kitchen, if that's what you're, if that's where you're going. I'm just trying to think of the use of auxiliary buildings that may get a little more creative than I've got a rentable second unit in my as an accessory apartment. I'm just we've certainly allowed you know an artist studio or that kind of space with plumbing, you know, but that we don't call that a, un a residential unit. So you might have a bath and a sink, you know, toilet and a sink, but that's not an apartment. Mm -hmm. But would you allow a structure that was, for instance, a practice unit for somebody who was in a band, but they had the house in the front, but there's a unit, it's not a garage. Yeah, we call in. that a workshop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Garage, storage, mm -hmm. yeah. If that person lived in the front mm -hmm. unit, mm -hmm. but not as a separate rental. So if I, I live over here, I can't rental. rent this as my mm -hmm. studio space mm -hmm. in a residential district, unless it's a mixed use mm -hmm. residential district. And then that's more of a retail kind of function. Mm -hmm. So are we, are we working against what we just changed to allow that the zoning where it did not allow it, now it does, but now we're saying, well, we should see that as a site plan. But site plan, you're not saying no. Yeah. That, that's the case. So the, right. the zoning says now that unit's allowed, but we do want to look at the details of the unit. I guess the issue is, you know, we do, we automatically, we've said site plan for anything that's over um, 2,000 square feet, mm -hmm. automatically site plan. So if this by itself was 2,000 square feet, it would definitely get a site plan right now. But if someone said, you know what, I really want to avoid that site plan, I'm going to build a 35 foot tall single family house that's 1,999 square feet. They could do that now because it's less than 2,000. You're not creating more than, um, you also have six parking spaces. If you're creating more than six parking spaces, that also triggers site plan review, which again is just the technical. You guys wanted to say, well, let's look at the design aspects, make sure it fits into the character of the neighborhood, the driveway, parking arrangement, buffers, and all of that come into the review under the site plan. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, I guess, and so there's that piece of it. 
if you were doing, um, you know, if you were doing a two or three family, that definitely triggered site plan. Um, or if you're doing townhouses, um, that's a site plan automatically. So it almost as though it's this loophole. And then I'll, the other scenario is if I create three of these detached single family homes that are, you know, well, I guess with three, if I'm doing it, they're not going to be detached. They're going to be. Well, but then all of these are considered single family, so they wouldn't in and of themselves trigger. So if I did this one this Looks year, like then motel. I came back next year and did another one, and then the year after I did a third one, they're all single families, they're all less than 2,000 square feet. But then in total, mm -hmm. you'd want to see that site. You'd want to see how it functions. you want to see how the parking is arranged. But someone could piece together a project mm -hmm that's over time adding up to something that really should have had site plan. So, site so plan what are those? Is that more of a special permit type discussion? Because so it seems like, excuse me, if, yeah. if they build a 35 foot, 1999 square foot unit, but it meets all the setbacks and it comes in front of site plan, site plan, we're, we're very limited. If, if, if somebody comes in front of us and we meet all the technical requirements, we're very limited in, in our capacity to reject something in the site plan. Except in your design standards, you um, have the massing and compatibility with the neighborhood um, criteria that wasn't there, it hasn't been there up until oh, the zoning sure. change. Yeah. So if this feels like a sore thumb sticking out in the backyards and sort of intruding on, on the neighborhood in terms of pri privacy and massing in the rear, I think you have that ability to say, no, you've got to you got to bring it down, you've got to reorient your building or something, you've got to do something else. So the massing, the diagrams that were, have been added now that show the massing, we now have that argument where we didn't have that six months. Right, right. I think, yep. She's oh, yeah, sorry. Um, you, you were talking about what sounded like something that went like this. If I tried to put all this stuff down at one time, yeah, I'd get reviewed. If I tried to put it down one time after one time, I wouldn't get reviewed at all. Right. That's what I'm saying is I think <laughs> there's a loophole that I don't think anybody thought about. It came up with, in a, one of these conversations and sort of, well, what if scenario when the building commissioner and I were sitting down talking about some of these questions that we've been fielding. And his concerns are reading the ordinance was, wait a second, they could come in today and do this one, and as soon as they're done with that permit, they'll pull another building permit and do this, because we know that overall they want to add seven townhouse units. Or They've got to have a certain coverage. I mean, it's got to be, I mean, there are some, still some constraints on doing that. There are still some constraints, but the, the idea is if you came in and proposed three units all at once, that would, of course, trigger site plan. But if you parsed it out, it wouldn't. And then, so it gets back to that definition of what's a single family. And so I guess the question is, do you all feel that it makes sense to add a, more specificity to what triggers site plan? So if you have an existing structure and you're adding another unit, does that automatically trigger site plan? Well, I think- Or is there a three year window, you know? If within a three year time frame you add we have this provision in another part of the zoning where we look at the project, actually it's the stormwater ordinance, if, you're, if a site is considered under you know, one development, if the project is within a three year timeline. So even if you do one part of your phase and then two years later you do another thing, we still look at it's the big piece, so you have to come in. Well, we should look at it even if it's 20, 20 years later, right? But I think we should try and eliminate that loophole and also the inconsistency between the way the accessory detached apartment is permitted, maybe by changing the square footage, I don't know. Or you could potentially do that by site plan. I don't know if that's what you're saying. We have the thing, I mean, the second principle structure requiring site plan. Right. It's still a lack. That's the trigger. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. right. I think that would be the simplest. Yeah, I agree. And I think now it. that we mm -hmm. have that massing kind of argument, which is almost borderline special permit discussion does this fit with <laughs> oh, everything that's around it <laughs> well, you know, but can you explain that the when we just do you have one of those diagrams from uh, yeah.
So these are the design standards. Um, in the new, I'm sorry, I apologize, my printer's losing steam. Um, so we have sort of, oh, this is the garage, sorry. Um, it, it's sort of the bulk and the, the scale of the structure relative to its surroundings. But it used to be with site plan, if it met the setbacks and we were given the footprint of the building and it met all the technical requirements, we had very little say in what it actually looked like. Yeah. Um, with the new zoning where the where the lot size changed and some of the setbacks changed, along with that came this the massing where it essentially it says it's kind of sort of got to look like everything else around it, and if it doesn't, we get to look at it. I feel like it gave us some leverage when the neighbors all came in and said, it's not right. Then right. you could say, you know, maybe they're right. right. Yeah. Does the 2,000 square foot thing seem a, like a lot? I mean, you, there's 1,200 square foot houses. Does that mean they could put the 1,999 square foot building well, that would dwarf it, the existing structure? Right now, 2,000 is the trigger, but it's what I guess the last thing that um, was thrown out was if we say any second principal structure mm -hmm. on, yeah. on a lot, remember, no matter the size. It's 2,000 yeah. except generally single family homes are exempt. So even if I'm building a 10,000 square foot single family home, I don't need site plan anyway, but the catch would be a second principal structure, then we get to look at the single family home. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the definition of principal structure? I mean, how can you have more than one principal structure? One larger than Principal means is the main one. Right, but um, I have my ordinance here, but it, <laughs> the way it's worded in the ordinance is you could have, you know, principal meaning um, principal use of the residential use as opposed to an accessory to that residential component, like garages and things are accessory to your main function on the site is, is residential. So it doesn't mean alone. principal in relation to the lot, it means principal in relation to the function of living yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. So I think 2000 is a good with that, that just that a secondary structure is, is an automatic site plan trigger. Mm -hmm. A and secondary principal structure. A second principal structure. Yes. So if I wanted to build a really nice playhouse in my backyard but not live in it. That's, that's an accessory structure. structure. Right. right. Okay. Um, do you want to do that? Yeah, but <laughs> what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what actually I'm thinking about are, are those becoming sort of surrogate structure. You know, yeah. in other words, yeah, I, right. that's exactly what I have as a studio, but what if I really did put a family member there and they lived there and they just came into my house to use the bathroom and you know or you know put a composting toilet out there it's this extra mm -hmm. structure and then you know yes. we think we know what people are going to do and they don't right <laughs> so right. I was just exploring that idea yeah. mm -hmm. can I, for one can I come over your house and play <laughs> <laughs> number two is what happened to the chicken coop it's the it's the other accessory structure oh, okay. <laughs> So um, about the accessory apart detached accessory apartments, now we still have in some of the zoning districts nothing more than a single family but for this detached accessory apartment. So um, I guess the question would be, do we leave it still a zoning board special permit in those districts? I guess we could do that in the suburban residential, the rural residential, and urban residential A. It's still zoning board special permit for this detached 900, no more than 900 square feet. But then site plan in the other districts, um, B and C, where we allow these second, you know, then it's not really so much an accessory apartment unless you don't meet the lot size requirement, which I think you could, I just want to make sure that makes sense to people yeah. and that you understand the distinction. Can I restate it? Because I don't. Okay. Um, in suburban residential where you have enough land that you could build an ex a, a, a building, a, a non-residential building, then you don't have to come to us at all. You can just do that. If you're building a single family house. No. Oh. I'm building a shed. Oh, if you're building a shed. We, well, this is another complication. We have no more than a thousand square feet of detached accessory structure allowed. In? in the SRR, unless it's for agriculture. 
So you have a bigger chicken. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, well, I, I can't even restate it. You're going to have to say it to me again. I'm, okay. I'm sorry to be confused. No, that's okay. So um, what I'm suggesting is that right now in the other districts where multifamily units or multiple units are not allowed, detached accessory apartments are allowed only with a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Right. If you have them attached in as part of the house, connected to the house, that's by right. You don't need a Zoning Board of Appeals. That's how it is now. So, um, by, but, but then but let's go to B and C districts where we allow multifamily, two unit, three unit, what have you. Um, we're saying detached secondary principal structures, there's no limit, 900 square feet, so we're not calling it an accessory apartment, but that triggers site plan approval. Um, and there will also potentially be situations where I can't, uh, my lot size is, doesn't, I don't have 5,000 square feet of lot area, so I don't qualify for two families, but I want a detached accessory apartment that's no more than 900 square feet that would still remain ZBA special permit as opposed to a site plan approval because at 900 square feet it would still be considered accessory to the main house on the lot. Does that make sense? I mean it's still sort of a complicated distinction but I don't know if, I don't know if there's another way around it. Um, but I mean to me part of this is what are we trying to encourage? I mean, it's better, and I think of the SR, the out on the areas. Right. If we think it's better for the accessory apartment to be attached, then the system we have now makes sense. Because one's allowed by right, one requires a special permit, so you're more likely to be attached. If what we really want to do is allow more and more accessory apartments, because that sort of creates a market rate affordable units, then in essence, flipping that from special permit to site plan approval is appealing. That's true. There's two ways to get an attached accessory apartment. One is for it to be encompassed in the existing shell. Right. And the other way is for it to be nestled up against the... No, we treat those the same. That's what I, my, that was my yeah. question. It's only it's detached, we treat it That's right, that was my question. Okay. Even if you can't see it, it because it's nestled entirely within the existing house. Right. The other, the other issue is, even though we might want to encourage detached accessory apartments the same as we encourage attached ones, let's say we go down that path, right now the zoning board is the body that has jurisdiction over that review. Mm -hmm. So if we modify it to site plan, it brings it to planning board, and it, that of course is a whole other conversation. I mean, the zoning board pretty regularly grants the requests that come in and a lot of times it's because they are in rural areas and nobody really knows <laughs> they're there right. anyway. Um, but at the same time I think the zoning board certainly feels that they have some responsibility to review those things so we have to have a conversation with the board. You know, so uh, I mean that's another issue. It's not that we can't have that conversation but I just want to make sure that that's out there too. Well, you opened this up by saying you had gotten a lot of interest from people doing it. So, is that what you actually expect? That there will be more requests from people to do accessory apartments or accessory buildings? Or they're coming to try to figure that out right now? I think they're trying to figure it out in the in town areas. Yeah, what makes sense? Um, and how could they add another unit? And, and, and a lot of it is because they want to renovate, but they need. You know they need some. Mm -hmm. They need to recapture some of that cost. Um, so, you know, we we haven't had actual projects. We've just had inquiries. Right. You think the inquiries have been triggered by the changes in zoning or by the changes in economics? Zoning. Zoning. That's interesting. We know. I mean, I hadn't asked the accessory apartments. We know a lot of people are looking at how can they create new lots. That's right. That right. Has some right. Of interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, there have been a few that have come and wanted to use existing garages and convert them. Mm -hmm. in, in many cases, they're too close to the lot line, so mm -hmm. that's going to prevent them from doing that. Um, but the cases where they are, they do meet those rear setbacks and side setbacks. Um, 
I think that may be the preferred the preferred mm -hmm. way, to, um, you know, to utilize an existing building. Right. Um, but I hadn't really, I hadn't thought too much about the distinction between the zoning board's, you know, purview over detached structures. And I guess I, I would say that, in my mind, I think you could rationalize keeping the special permit with zoning board for detached structures, even for the B and C districts, because really the only case where you'd be probably going down that path would be if your lot size is not big enough to support what the zoning now allows for, as a second principal structure on a parcel. So potentially that in itself is a reason to trigger special permit. Because if you're not fitting the criteria and you're sort of asking for special permission to do that even though your lot size doesn't need it. I just want to refocus on what we started with about talking about some of the demographic stuff. You know, sort of Northampton's mm -hmm. population dropping. Um, our population is dropping significantly because none of us are having babies. So mm -hmm. we actually have a significant inflow of people and probably have more inflow of people than we have in the 25 years I've been here. Mm -hmm. But it's just not keeping up with the fact that people just are having babies. So, you know, um, and so, and but we do know we still have a pretty low vacancy rate for our rent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it creates more units may counter some of that stuff. The question of units in which one person lives and then there's a, a, a secondary unit so that you you have uh, the renter is on property with the owner of the of the house um, not having that is been a serious problem in Amherst obviously where there's so many students where houses are going out and being rented and there's no close ownership behaving. Have we had problems like that here? Certainly isolated problems. I don't think we have anything like Amherst mm -hmm. does in terms of mm -hmm. That's not been an issue particularly. Um, do we have a lot of students from Smith that are living there's some from Smith, but most Smith students are on campus. Most of them are on campus. Have to get UMass. We tend to get a lot of graduate students. Uh -huh. I'm sure we get other graduates too, but it's not uh -huh. you know the the bigger number. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, I, I'm not I'm not really Positive. sure. I think with uh, per, they, but they still have to at, so at whatever point that is, they still have to get approval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wondered about that. Mm -hmm. So then circling back, is the premise to leave the, the ZBA process intact and just at B and C, a secondary principal structure needs site plan approval? I think that's what I heard. I think that makes sense if you guys mm -hmm. want to. Mm -hmm. So I would write up the language mm -hmm. to tweak the zoning. There's one other thing, I guess. Um, so what is the new Yeah, the big thing, the, the moratorium stuff. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I was thinking, I brought tonight. Yes. <laughs> the moratorium thing, so we can add this to the language when we go forward to address the moratorium, if you think we should be going forward to address the moratorium and not just let it run out, then I would attach the site plan thing to that as opposed to bring it along separately. Mm -hmm. so. The only thing in the back of my mind is why do we have essentially the same kind of thing going before two different boards? I mean, one board or the other board. I, do, do all the towns or jurisdictions have both a ZBA and a planning board? Yeah, state law doesn't allow you to merge them together. There are some special legislations like Devon's Enterprise Commission covers both boards, and I, I don't know if it's the same as true for the, the Wayland Air Force Base. Um, could we talk about it years ago? Is, could we, is it worth going for special legislation to merge them together? That's some some yeah. benefits. And just, I'm not sure we care enough to actually want to go to the legislature for it, but I don't disagree. It doesn't really make sense. It makes it more confusing for us things. Okay. I'm going to talk about that more time. Mm -hmm. No, she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, and my more time she goes. Um, Is it seven or ten? <laughs> well, that's the thing we kept going back to. Um, 
<laughs> so right now, the moratorium applies to seven or more units, mm -hmm. but the um, the special permit threshold applies to ten or more units. So. Um, so if you remember, one of the things of the, the compromises that came through in this, as this made its way through the public hearing process was to create a special permit threshold for, um, oh wait a second, now I'm getting um, confused again. There was two different thresholds. I thought 10 was only for subdivision rights. Right, right. So the moratorium right. and the special permit are both seven. Right. So the moratorium, so so the special permit threshold um, for B and C districts. So if you're creating more than ten multifamily in C or townhouse units in B, if you're creating more than seven units, that automatically triggers special permit. Now you said ten and seven both when you said that, so I'm still confused. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading the next line because then under it was special permit at seven. But then there were additional criteria for review starting at 10 units. And so I guess the idea is this is too complicated to have the distinction <laughs> yes, between 7 and 10. <laughs> so let's just go back. 7 seemed to be the concern, concerning number. So let's start at 7 and say special permit starts at 7, but all the special permit criteria apply to 7 and above and don't have an intermediate right. within that special permit. Yes. Okay. Which is what I was trying to get to, but then I got confused. <laughs> Which where's another line? Ten, ten right now is only for the subdivision rates. Right. So we're just saying make it all right. seven. Make it seven. Yeah. Okay. Right. So. Now, but we do need to separate for this conversation. We, we won't get to tonight. We need to amend the subdivision regs anyway. And part of that, we need to talk about these various. I mean, seven is a tiny project. So maybe we have separate criteria and subdivision regs for very small projects. But nonetheless, it will get that criteria so. So current, so what was passed and adopted, but for the moratorium, was that design. When you hit 10 units or more, the additional design review by the board would include making sure there was compliance with um, length of streets, the same kind of length of street issue um, that is restricted in subdivision rules. So there are a couple features from the subdivision regs that were that would then be applicable to any project that um, was 10 or more units. So, um, and I'll talk about that in that list. I think we put that in here. Um, but the idea is, so when, when, when I brought this back to you, I don't remember when it was a couple of months ago, and I said, you know, what's, what's happening with, um, you know, how do we want to go about this? And the idea was really to get more feedback from Ward 3 neighborhood that really raised this as an right. issue. Mm -hmm. What is the, is there anything more that we can do? What's the real issue? So, I think there were two basic points that I took away from my conversation with, um, actually I sat down with Bill Dwight and Jim Nash and um, tried to sort of, you know, hash through this. And so, there were two concerns. One was <clears throat> the idea of massing or the, the breakup of massing that might be along a side wall that abuts a residential neighborhood. So if you imagine that you have um, a lot that's mid-block um, that uh, has enough to do 10 or 15 units, let's say, well, okay, let's take Henry Street. That was the deep lot, right, mm -hmm. that everybody was concerned about. And all the houses were along the front, and so a lot of the design standards talked about presentation to the front, but we also had some additional buffer requirements for side setbacks. I think um, Jim also expressed concern that we have design criteria for the sides of the building, where it's you know abuts um, neighbors that may have private yards in the back or something like that. So that we address, it, so that there's not a long blank mm -hmm. wall, right. mm -hmm. or that there's some look like a motel. right? That it's not just a box that's mm -hmm. set up there. So um, there was a concern about addressing those side facades. And then the other piece is the interaction between public and private space. And um, I don't know that we'll get to all of his concerns, but I think there were some pieces of it that certainly um, made sense and were, were valid in that 
um, the, the best way that he described it is when you create these sort of courtyard um, developments, um, as, as an example, um, or lots that are deep and uh, maybe front on a driveway that it's not so clear the public is invited down into the property, even though someone may live 10 units down, that it feels like a private enclosed enclave. And how do you create a situation where there's some still essence of public access, mm -hmm. even though there's not public right-of-way or easement or anything like mm -hmm. that, but um, so that we're not creating these, um, I guess, clusters of private little pockets of private little subdivisions or developments within the urban context. Um, so I looked at some ordinances around the country and tried to look at some of those standards and the interface that um, is, is created or attempted to be created with these new developments that are in, you know, more infill. And we, um, um, Wayne and I came up with a list of um, options to try to address both of those things and maybe come up with a better sense of special permit criteria that would be applicable from seven on and not have that division. Do you talk about the different scales about like Fort Hill? No, I haven't gotten to that part okay. yet. So, so in doing that, we know that there are a couple of projects that um, we wanted to sort of put on the table and, and play out these and, and why we think some of these are important and how they might play out. So I don't know if do you want to do yeah. Did you bring um, Pomeroy? Is that on there? No, I just brought okay. it for you. So, actually, I don't know if we had anything other than on the map. Maybe we could flip this over. So, let's take the Shaw's Motel site as sort of an example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, this isn't blown up too well. Let me come up here. So, um, this is Route 9, and then here's Pomeroy Terrace. And mm -hmm. this is the corner here. These mm -hmm. two lots is, are where Shaw's mm -hmm. is. So there are actually two parcels, and there are three buildings, right? Three buildings. Three three buildings, buildings an acre. Including the, the motel. And it's not quite an acre. Right, right, mm -hmm. So um, one of the things, um, so, so we ran through this, and we actually sat down with, um, there have been, not too many, but a few calls from prospective buyers of that site. Mm -hmm. And we've sat down and run some different layout scenarios and how it would fit within the current zoning. And I think one of the things that one of the things we liked about one of the designs we saw was um, townhouse units wrapping the corner of Bridge and Pomeroy. And it wasn't multifamily per se. I mean, it wasn't one unit on top of the other, but um, I felt like that was a really good example of, that I thought would fit in with the neighborhood because it's not creating parking on the street. It's got, I mean, that is a busy street, um, but it also could, and, and it's obviously a, um, an important corner when you're, you're coming around that corner into downtown. So filling up that void with, with um, units that are um, sort of wrapped that corner, I think made sense. With, so the, front, with the front out. Right, mm -hmm. and the parking in the back, mm -hmm. so you'd access it. There was a one driveway entrance off of Pomeroy Terrace into the back, and then garage entrances that would sort of go under those units partially. And then there was one unit reserved in the back corner of the lot. So sort of we took that as um, um, sort of a, a play space, if you will, to figure out what made sense in that and maybe what needed to be tweaked to make that even a better project. So. And what bad thing could someone do? <laughs> With <that>? yeah, <laughs> right. So um, I'll turn this back over to the draw. Um, so if we have a uh, bridge here, do you bring that paper? What's that? Do you want some fresh paper? <laughs> <laughs> sure. We <laughs> don't have other projects. So and a have, marker, Wayne. Yeah. What about the Charlie Rice board? That one right here. That's They're right, Wayne. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll get killed if we. I don't oh, think there are any smart. Well, there may be some markers over there, but I don't want to get yeah, in trouble. Yeah, it says do not. <laughs> so, if we oh. have. <laughs> so, if we have. Um, oh, great. Bridge here. Um, 
and um, Pomeroy comes around here, and then that goes off up here. So there's this sort of whole corner here, and the driveway access was sort of pushed back here, and you have the front loaded units here, going out this way with front porches and everything. And then there was this back unit here. So the idea was, um, you know, how do you, one of, the, one of the issues would be, you know, this is all great, I think, and this fits in within the design character. This would be 12 units. So. That was from here. What's that? Oh, did I design it correctly? Was there a break here? Yeah, there's a break here. And then another building here? Yeah. Yeah. So the driveway was here, another building here, and then a building back here. So the driveway came in here and there were a garage entrances like so that. So you wanted to have a garage and a room behind the garage to park your second car if you had it? And this is all parking here. Something like that. So this is driveway. So I guess the idea is how do we, you know, how do you get pedestrians safely in here to go to this unit? How does that feel like anybody from the public can go and visit their friend here? How does this person reach Bridge Road? Um, or, you know, if you're coming from town and you want to get to this unit. And what's so, behind it, this way here? This is um, a big a house condo. and then the condo. Mm -hmm. and there's yeah. a doctor's office mm -hmm. or some, a dentist's office somewhere here. I think there's still one other unit here, dentist, and then back here is that condo. And in Pomeroy, it's just big homes. Yeah. And then, yeah, these okay. are homes right. and then on this side. Okay. Um, and then this is mm -hmm. nonprofit or multifamily something or other. So, um, I'm sorry, this looks terrible. But the I, so I guess so. Some of these points um, are, you know, making sure that you have direct pedestrian access to the street, um, and then also safe access to any parking. Obviously, parking in the rear is sort of always what you know, we've been pushing for um, and what we want. We don't want that face in the street. So I think we think that was a good example, but there was still some tweaking that probably would make it better. And why not have the language in the ordinance so the board is, has clear jurisdiction to say, well, you didn't provide this, you have to do this or else we can't approve your permit. So I think, I don't know if Wayne, you want to, if, what points on there that we added to that. I think there were. To this? Yeah, we broke down. We just want to go to the yeah. Let's keep doing the context for this and come back to us. Yeah. So, so Fort Hill is the Lyman estate that Smith College is going to sell at some point. This, this yeah, is probably a one-off. It's probably the only project of this size in the area. But it's a very real project, the exact same yeah. issues come up for that. Mm -hmm. So we were sort of playing with, you know, what are the issues going to come up for Fort Hill? We do have to see, you know, decide to have a neighborhood meeting on uh, Monday, February 3rd at 5.30 that you're certainly all welcome to come to. But it's, it's going to be some of the same issues, and this is, in that case, it's about Fort Hill, but it's going to be thinking about what are the unifying principles that may be, in fact, represented in the special permit. Right. So, you know, it's a similar thing, you know, Carolyn's talking about, this is just sort of really just, you know, trace paper and playing quickly, but, you know, I think some people in the neighborhood would like this to be isolated. I think we generally think everything should be connected and, and connect the grid, and that it shouldn't be sort of a separate gated community. So, South Street. Yeah, sorry. Um, South Street, Lyman, the wraps around. There's a townhouse project here in Old Bristol, but this neighborhood is primarily single and two-family, and I guess some three family? There shouldn't. Um, and so, you know, ignore the details of this. It's just sort of thinking about, you know, how do we have a connection so that it's not a dead end street, mm -hmm. but not a connection becomes a big cut through. How do we have, and this may not work in selling because no one's going to build a loop road unless they can do homes here, 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 and here. Mm -hmm. It may not be thick enough. But sort of thinking, you know, our rule of thumb for subdivisions is we don't allow dead end streets more than 500 feet. So saying, well, how do you have, you know, the road would have to loop. You couldn't have more than 500 feet, so the developer might want to loop back over here. Um, and, and then the idea for the neighborhood, but it applies elsewhere, is very thin, uh, you know, lots that aren't very deep, mm -hmm. um, sort of maps the neighborhood. We're, the final product we're going to do for the neighborhood is we're literally cutting and pasting whole blocks over here and moving them here and showing how they work. And whether they're single family homes or townhouses or row houses, I don't really care because that still has a development along the street as opposed to a big apartment complex that has right. a different feel. So then thinking about some of those lessons, 
as well on this on this list. It wouldn't just be for Fort Hill, though. You know, likewise, think about it. somewhere near there should be some park land that may not matter for a seven-unit project, but might matter for a sixteen-unit project. This is what fourteen acres. This. I don't know the size actually. You can put up. I, I, I've heard yeah, fourteen. Okay. So it's nice to see it because a lot of it's floodplain. Nothing's going to happen over here. Right. Mm -hmm. Practically, not much might happen over here. Um, well, is the dike large. part of the land yeah. itself? Fact, it's not. They wrap around the dike. Okay. So this is the old carriage house or whatever. There's a brick thing, and this is where Leonard Baskin used to live. That's where Leonard Baskin, yes. yes. And that's the one in the state. So. Yeah. And then that's the metal building that's the right. preschool. And then this is the path that goes down that's right. past Ken's house. Um, do you foresee the, you, you, you've acted like there would be access through what is senior or you know, student housing or whatever. Smith's. <laughs> You know, 19, 1950s. I don't think there's much value in those buildings. I don't either, but it uh, might uh, it it access Smith through there is needed in order to make the transportation system work in that area. Right. And so, so that's what we've assumed, sort of two loop roads in here. Yeah. And we play with the road actually, frankly, coming in this way. You know, if you came in this way, because we're you know it's good not to be dead ends, but you wouldn't want to be a cut, a cut through. So right. another scenario we play with is. This actually may be the road, but not connecting here. If the road came here and looped around, then you never. It's pretty cut steep. Through. You're not going to cut through. It's right. Pretty it's, it's pretty steep, right? Would so you we sort of use these as templates as to try to figure out what are concepts that make sense that should be put into the zoning that we want to make sure everybody's thinking about ahead well, of time? And I haven't heard you rule before. We don't like streets, dead end streets, more than 500 feet. I mean, there so, are. So that's already a rule in the subdivision regs, okay. which applies that this is over 10 units. But it's not necessarily a rule for an apartment complex within the street. So that's the sort of thing of how do we right. take that out. And, and 500 feet, at least for those of you who are open, it's too, in, a, in a big city, blocks of 250 feet to 300 feet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that we're particularly stringent. It's still no. a longer way than right. would be ideal. Let's say 250 to 350. Was that? I Here's the plan. Oh, I, I said that 300 is not a very long block. No, but in urban context, it is. Um, I mean, you know, New York is 250 feet by 500 feet, is, is what we have. Um, but lots of cities who, who specify, say, 250 feet to 300 feet. Austin, I think, says 300 feet. So then, to go, then is it worth going through these one by one? So that that's, you know, obviously we had, but. You know, so this, the, the first one is what Carolyn said. All these criteria would be seven units. So I have seven for some and, and ten for some. Um, it is a special permit. When do you do number two? Because that's yours, I think. Um, right. So it's sort of the example we're showing. The first row of buildings along a street shall face the street and add to the streetscape to the extent possible. Um, and no parking between that, the building and the, and the street, um, except as a driveway access. Well, in that old housing I was talking about is exactly, I mean, it's ugly anyway, but it is exactly that. The backs face the street, the cars park on the street, and yeah. they face into a courtyard that, you know, was... Hey, and remember, what we're trying to do, just generally before we go through this, I should have said this in the beginning, is when we're doing site plan approval, because you said you have to approve site plan projects, right. or we're doing things by right, we need things that are very measured to tell people exactly what the rules are. Right. Mm -hmm. When we do special permits, I fear we're too far going the other direction of fits the character of the neighborhood. It doesn't really give anyone feedback and not something I want to defend. Right. So we're looking for something that's halfway between those things. That still gives you and the developer a fair amount of discretion, because each of these sites are different, but it means more than fits the character of the neighborhood right. that, that's out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. So no, I'm just moving along. Any project shall meet the connectivity requirements, including making the streetscape uh, between the property and the road pavement pedestrian friendly and fully in conformance with city best practices, including granite curbs, concrete sidewalks, tree belts, and when possible, rain gardens and appropriate drainage improvements. So, so this is partially, you know, we talk about form-based code, or we don't have any form-based code, but one of the form-based code typically is you code not only the private realm, what the public, what the developer does, but the public realm, the streetscape as well. And we just want to say, between your project and the street, you own that. We don't have a set standard, but you own that. We expect you to. And as a practical matter, you guys always do this as conditions. 
and people always complain about those conditions. But if a sidewalk's in bad shape, fix it. The trees are in bad shape, fix them. If we want rain gardens, you know, these should be modeled. The good thing with these projects is these aren't incredibly expensive because they're not using up a lot of street frontage, but they need to bring that stuff up to them. Um, so then sub um, point A is sort of what we talked about in the context of this um, property, the line of the state, is that projects should connect to surrounding neighborhoods with either bicycle and pedestrian access and or um, driveways and roadways or you know in addition to driveways and roadways connecting to e each other internally but also externally connecting to the neighborhood so to continue that fabric of the neighborhood and this isn't to be anti-apartments and say we don't want big blocks but it is sort of say mm -hmm. you know the street everything should be developed along the street whether it's a public street or private it should look and feel the same you know, part of going back to the subdivision regs where we want, so this stuff is adding cost to developers. Part of the subdivision regs we want to talk about is, right now we expect streets to be 22 feet wide with granite curbs and concrete sidewalks. On both sides. On both sides. And we're talking about, if you could really do, we talked about shared streets before, if you could really do a street which is maybe only 20 feet wide and really stopping cars from going faster than 15 miles an hour, I mean, we don't need separate sidewalks. We use ways to save developers money in that direction. Yeah. Is this kind of street to be accepted by the city as a street? So this would be neutral to that. The answer is probably not in most projects. Lyman Estate, probably yes, but probably not anywhere else in Ward B. I just don't think we've any of the sites of the size. But that's also relevant to changing the subdivision regulations, because right now the subdivision re regulations don't allow for that sort of um, urban, more urban type street um, or infill street where you might have less pavement or narrower pavement or shared street. I think DBW is much more, um, well I know they're much more um, leery of accepting anything that's outside of the regulation. So which just points to the fact that we really need to work on changing the regulations with their input and their, their blessing. Um, so that if there were a situation like um, this to come forward that might have a shared street that it potentially could become public if it made sense because it was connecting to the street grid and it was just expanding that. Because on the one hand you want it to look and feel and be public, on the other hand it's not public and that's what I was trying to get well, to. Do you think regardless of anything else, people who want to look and feel like public, that includes public access, public easement. So, Whoever maintains it isn't the same. It, none of these things should be gated. They should be, the public should feel welcome to wander through and walk their dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you, but you are saying granite curbing and, and when do you decide things have to have granite curbing? And If it's going to be curbing, I think is the end. If you, if you can really do avoid and do low impact development and not do curbing, we don't want the asphalt that falls apart in three years. So really well, I, I can't help but think about Bear Hill, where it's new and there is, and I just, and that really looks like a street. I mean, that yeah. doesn't look like, is this a street or should I or shouldn't I not go up that street? It looks like a street and it doesn't have it. That's so I was trying to, I was trying to decide what the image was and right. where the criteria held. Well, and we don't. Actually, it's probably right after Bear Hill is approved that we put in the we put in the site plan approval criteria that you had to match for materials what you're doing oh. in the street. Yeah. So okay. bituminous is allowed. Okay. Um, and some of the things will come up for a developer is like if it's a public street, they have to make sure there's room for people to park off the street for snow plowing. Hmm. And it may be some of these sites are small enough to develop. You know, if every house only has 50 feet of frontage. The cost of homeowners paying to plow the street isn't that much. I mean, hammer, you know, spread out mm -hmm. over the project, um, and literally, you know, not being able to park on the street eats up a lot of real estate. So maybe some developers don't even want the land. Mm -hmm. to take over. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when do you think you might look at subdivision rules for 22 to 20? What's in our plan for two months from Because I actually all for that. And one of the things that we talked to actually with Councillor, um, previous Councillor um, Owen Freeman Daniels was that we would look at 
looking at sort of those urban subdivision regulations. Yeah. And we've had discussion with DPW. The balls in our court are not there. We have to write these, but at least they, they sort of know what's coming and you know and have agreed to review it. And so, um, so soon. Did, did anybody suggest uh, co-housing up in that area, in the area off of Hollywood? It certainly could work there. Again, we were looking at this more as principles that we learned for the, for the, the regulations as opposed to what we actually looking for. That's a separate discussion. It's you know, but none of this would preclude. No, absolutely not. Right. I just want to think, what would a good developer do to make sure we're allowing it? What would a bad developer do to make sure we're stopping it? And then ultimately that's going to be whoever sells the property who's going to decide at that, at that level. So the next point, um, driveways and roadways shall either have separate sidewalks or be designed as a shared street, uh, focused on pedestrians and bicyclists, and engineered to keep speed below 15 miles per hour. So if you were to have a sort of limited um, scope and a small lot like you know the Shaw's Motel site and you have a driveway in there you want to make sure that it's safe enough for you know people to be walking back and forth as an urban area you want people to be walking downtown and that kind right. of thing. Um, and so this when, you, when you say shared street in that sense you don't mean like I'm thinking about the, the you know commingling of bicycles and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Okay. And that's why the 15 miles an hour is so important. Is it, we're basically telling the developer, you want to do a simple asphalt street, fine, give us granite curbs and sidewalks, and that's $150 a foot. Spend the extra money in the road, which might be curbs, might be allowed on parking, there might be changing materials, lots of things that add a lot of money, but in the long term it's still saving money by dropping those, those curbs and sidewalks. What are you going to tell a developer to do to a street for the pedestrian walking in it? if it's not sidewalks? So a bunch of different approaches places have. I think that's the choices we want to spend time on. But some of these people have, say, a six foot wide granite, I mean, a six foot wide um, concrete part of the street. It looks and feels like a sidewalk, much thicker so, so the car can destroy it. And you have literally cobblestone, I don't know if that's too expensive, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. brick pavers mm -hmm. that, that build the street out to 20 feet. Okay. So the cars can drive, but there's a clear message that people are walking here. Okay. Um, there's a design which we liked, um, a deep over cried wooden, of using parked cars sort of as a chicane. Mm -hmm. So parked cars on the side of the street for 65 feet and the other side of the street back and forth. Um, so you know, there's a bunch of different methods of doing them. Okay. The biggest challenge for every single one of them is that snow plowing in the winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then number five actually also came out with a conversation with Ward 3, and I think we've, you all probably heard it a lot through, you know, the, the loss of open space. So um, it's really that all projects shall include a park or civic space that is easily accessible, available, and desirable for the residents of the project. So seven units is a small project, and maybe it's just a little pocket area that functions for those people. It's not talking about creating public parks. It's really about making sure that there's some little oasis within the project. Right. And, and so you might still, you know, instead of saying you have whatever the 20% or 40% open space is, it can't just be a grass strip around the perimeter of the project and that, oh great, that adds up to my 40%, I'm done. But when you're building more units, you need to have some functional space because it provides relief in the neighborhood, even if it's just visual but also for the people living there. And, and the reverse side is true that not only is it quality, but it, these could be really tiny spaces. We're not talking about it. Right. Yeah. Big, but. I, I can understand how we could look at something and decide whether it was accessible and available, but I'm not quite sure how you quantify desirable. Mm -hmm. Well, even when that, I'm thinking about on Hospital Hill where, you know, that you finally take a lot that can't get developed and you make it a park, but, and that's where the fountain is. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we're going to, if, if what you're after here is um, a, what we are thinking about, I think it's going to have to be more concrete. I mean, we're going to have to figure out a way to say that. Maybe it's okay. a proportion of the area of, you know, if you're developing 14 er acres, it's some proportion. If you're developing two acres, it's different. I, if we, I mean, maybe the, the size of the property is the threshold for what we want. I'd be really cautious about the size of acreage. I mean, use, use this one as an example. 
they could get lots of acreage down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe what we want instead of desirable is that it's a primary focal point. That the yeah, average just person something, 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 something tangible is missing from yeah, the yeah. at the moment. Yeah, we can look at that. Who's going to maintain the space? So That's the, the owners. I mean, it would be private unless they're creating a park that they want to say, hey, this is city a great civic room. space. We'll dedicate it to the city. Right. That's another question. But this isn't meant to say, to, to create an exaction, say every development has to give the city public space. Right. So it probably, in most cases, would be a private, private ownership. But you know, you could have a little playground, you know, or a mini a swing set or something with benches or a, a fountain. Spot, right? Yeah. Um, that doesn't have to be big, but it's it's been thought out and mm -hmm. it's not just a leftover piece of grass strip. So it could be a thousand or two thousand square feet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the example I gave before they took it over is the the granite steps in front of shop was now shop therapy. Before they put all their stuff blocking it, that used to be the most heavily used spot in town. There'd be more people there than the Classy Park. You know, and that was 20 square feet or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, the old, the old shark there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. That's a flashy yeah. one. With the steps. Yeah. <laughs> He's showing the video. Though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and this, number six, is sort of what I think I started out with. Um, generally align front facades with those facades on either side, um, sorry, this is still the street, on either side of those um, projects. So if it's just an infill literally between two other existing houses, make sure the plane of that new building is consistent with the abutting two parcels. Right. Um, That's seven, you skipped six. I did skip. Oh, at least of the thing I'm Oh, right. So, okay. And I didn't understand yeah. six. So. Okay. So, <laughs> building project. So, this is what I meant. <laughs> I did start. <laughs> Sorry, I'm skipping all over. And we're all at sixes and sevens here. <laughs> so, six. So, this is going back to that side facade issue. And, and if you have a long wall that's going, you know, deep into a project that abuts an existing neighbor, that wall you have to consider in terms of additional design elements that break up that massing or create some kind of um, offsets. I think it so needs to be a sentence because it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. You put it in a shell and include somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere along yeah. the line it needs to be a sentence, okay? Yeah. Okay, got it. I'm so quick to run Yeah, that, you know. <laughs> well, see, that's the problem is to think about this sure. stuff. Right. Okay. So does it make sense though that, that yeah. what facade we're referring to? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then um, so seven I started to talk about. Um, but those front facades have to align with the abutting front facades and that other setbacks um, may be appropriate depending on the context the structure is located in. So so this is, you can imagine, generally in home, in a nice mature neighborhoods when homes line up, you want the gap, the empty lot to line up. Right. But we have some bad neighborhoods in town. We have neighborhoods with this junky stuff there, and we don't want to pretend we're frozen forever. So right. Right. that's the special program criteria to give flexibility. Right. Well, and you'll have, along this project, you'll have no streetscape. Right. So did, are you wanting to say looks like across the street? Would that? That's what I like, yeah. Now, if they had a garage that was set back from the house, this wouldn't prevent that from happening. Right. Even though right. it is a front facade, in a way. Right. General line. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, so the, the the item is not numbered. It's just other food for thought. That um, options should we be including options or incentives for affordable housing? Um, so the challenge here is. I love all the zoning that city council just passed. But in essence, what we did is we said we want this density. We want to be a dense town, so we're giving this away. What that means is we can't do what some towns do. Some towns have a zoning that's less than they really are happy to take, mm -hmm. and then they give that extra density mm -hmm. in return for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. We've already done that, so we don't really have a lot to offer. Mm -hmm. So the thing we were playing with is, well, what we could offer is going from a special permit to site plan approval. Mm -hmm. One of the things, though, is that it would appear that we've created an opportunity for a lot of 
smaller uh, auxiliary kinds yeah. of spaces, which ought to, I mean, maybe not affordable housing in some technical sense of the word, but that ought to be bringing some more modest housing into the community. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I'm after after watching the hill get developed, and we, you know there was so much sort of talk about workforce housing up there, and then right. you know 450 for new construction, mm -hmm. you know isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean I think it has to get more structure to it if you really do think mm -hmm. you're going to get yeah, sure workforce housing. 450. And the last bungalow for like 580 or something. 580. Like that. I saw that one in the 580. For the bungalow, yeah. 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 Portable to somebody. <laughs> Well, you know, and I think that a lot of this infill, you know, infill already is sort of on the path to creating potential for more affordability because there aren't the upfront infrastructure costs mm -hmm. like we have at the state hospital. But it's still, I guess the question that we are grappling with is do we need another that may be more about sort of the lower end of that um, affordability range and potentially even subsidized mm -hmm. affordability. Mm -hmm. So does that Is make there sense? a category of senior housing? I mean, I don't, I'm asked rather naively. I mean, you can't do it. Massachusetts specifically says you can't do age discrimination except for housing 55 and above. And some places have done that. East Hampton did that for a while. They made it easier. And then they were getting a lot of, of projects and decided to stop doing that or to do less. But um, you can't necessarily get more state money. Our state doesn't want to do a lot of restrictions. So in terms of the market rate affordable, yes. In terms of tax credit stuff, Massachusetts doesn't love that. Okay. Because everybody likes older people and they don't like poor people is the reality. <laughs> In, in this business about incentives for affordable housing, when we're essentially talking, and I don't know what the amount of land is in this, but in a lot of the other stuff we've been talking about, we're talking about very small pieces of property. Right. So you're not going to get, when you say incentives, it's not going to be extra housing in there. So what is it right. going to be? Well, that's what I'm saying. The only thing we can think about is making it a site plan approval instead of a special permit. Special permit scares people. Not only going through the planning board, but the appeal that could happen from the neighborhood. So, so if I, yeah, so if I were to do seven units, I know that's a special permit, but if I uh, do one of the units as an affordable unit, and then I know I can just go through site plan, wow. that may be an incentive to have someone offer up one of those units as an affordable unit as part of a project. But you're right, it's very small, and it's um, tough to potentially balance the numbers at that small scale. If, well. if all these other stuff is really important to have all these restrictions and things on it, that seems like a, that's a hard trade-off to make to, a, to say it's really important to do the, all this approval with all these criteria, but if you put one other thing in here, we, we can pull a lot of that away. That's hard. I mean, the affordable housing is important, but that's kind of an interesting... Well, I guess the question is, couldn't you do those same things by site plan approval? Because again, you, you have the right to do conditions for site plan. I mean, if it's, you can't say no, you couldn't do the projects to the site plan approval. Special permit, you could say, mm -hmm. you didn't do it, you can satisfy us for turning it down. Mm -hmm. Site plan approval says, you got to approve it, but you could still condition, say, you have to have articulation of the building facade, and your dead end street can't be more than 500 feet, all those sorts of things. You could require those. I, I guess, I mean, the language that we're trying to get is specific enough that it, it's it's enforceable in a site plan. Right. It's hard to view. It's definitely hard to do it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, that's the yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you're right. There'd be probably a lot of question through the process about the rationale for just sort of, as you suggested, throwing all that stuff out or throwing the special permit out just to get one or two, you know, affordable units. I think, you know, that would need to be explained pretty clearly, I think, for counselors and for constituents yeah. to understand why you would do that. But we well, could also just say you have to do 10% units have to be affordable. I think the problem is we see a lot of developers who's going to stay below those thresholds. Okay, mm -hmm. 
And the other question is, do we need an incentive for affordable housing, or is allowing this additional density enough at this point to say, well, we might not get subsidized affordability, but we'll get more market rate affordable units just because we're allowing some more units here and there within the existing I, framework. I think that argument has more teeth than mm -hmm. the bungalow argument that was, well, they're not going to be a certain price point, but they're just the footprint is such a small size that by default they're going to be affordable when they ultimately more at all. But I think we get more affordable housing out of these small little pocket developments I think, than you would. Yeah, I think as long as our rental prop market is as tight as it is, that more rental is helpful. I mean, in other words, I'd, I'd make that, I'm with you, I'm making yeah. that argument that because if we're talking about new construction, that's the conundrum you're in. It's not going to be affordable. Right. It's so expensive to do. Well, I think some people have to learn a new, new definition for affordable, too. All right. <laughs> I, I just think it, it would be hard to mandate. I don't think you could say 10% it has to be affordable, whatever the threshold is, because then I think the development just wouldn't happen. And then, and then what the trigger would be, what the number of units would be to ask for that, I would be of the mind to not ask for it at all. What's the current affordable? affordable uh, 11 rate? Mm -hmm. 11 11 okay, and if it falls before 10, below 10%, then developers can come in and do pretty much anything they want? Well, it's an easier process. You know, if this project happens at hospital, that's 83 assisted living residences, of which 40, 43 would be affordable, that would make a big Mm -hmm. They'll buy us a couple of years of affordability. But it's, I mean, it's reasonable if I mean, we can keep even if we require 10% um, affordability. We can. You know, well, I mean, in theory, but we might get projects that are below yeah. that threshold. That, or like single houses, too. But it is yeah. true that I mean, the more we've gotten, more, you know, zoning has encouraged a lot of, of accessory apartments. There's a market rate affordable. It's probably the biggest place where zoning's been successful. Mm -hmm. But more the affordable units have been more just the other efforts. I mean, you know, there's a lot of developers out there, half is out there looking for future sites or tax credit projects. So it may be that the very fact that we're allowing more units mm -hmm. is going to create affordable units because of people like half of Valley City mm -hmm. who will buy an acre of land and put in mm -hmm. 16 units that are out there. And so that makes it more allows us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's in how we. You know, each time we think we're going to lose it, and another big project comes. State hospital creates a bunch of new So, yeah, I mean, Ice Pond is is a pretty upscale development that has four affordable units yeah. in it. And you can tell what they are because they only have single car garages. <laughs> so leave it as is. Mm -hmm. I would say yeah. that's my vote. Yeah. Are there, we've been tweeting the language we have here, which is great, but are there whole major things we're missing that you can think about? That requires a whole different Yeah, and you're getting lots of time. This isn't your last chance to get yeah. back. <laughs> so do you need anything from us relative to this tonight or not? Mm -hmm. no? Do we need to do it? You know, more versions to come back. I mean, okay. what I want to do is I don't... I don't want to this clock tick out, so I want to make sure we mm -hmm. get something to mm -hmm. council so it's an effect mm -hmm. if I have a chance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is there going to be a lot of re-educating? You've got a new council. Yeah, it could be some. Yeah, mm -hmm. Some of those councilors were participating in the process, so hopefully mm -hmm. it won't be started from there. And part, you know, and part of the reason we're starting a discussion about this project is partially because the neighbors really worried it goes on here. But parts of, frankly, it's another way to, f to give us feedback. Mm -hmm. as, as we think through this, we may come out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had one other thing, um, well, two other, I guess, minutes. And then yeah. um, this Cook Avenue street acceptance, which came in just recently, actually. So you know, we did the whole series of street acceptance requests. And this piece is Cook Avenue from Hatfield Street intersection, so right by the, that Walmart um, back intersection, mm -hmm. up to a point just past the Pine's Edge driveway, so not quite to the 
basically to the edge of the gravel drive lot that goes to the Moose Lodge. Mm -hmm. And BPW voted to recommend approval for that section. So believe it or not, that's not a public street. Yeah, that's uh, just uh, uh, it's just one of those leftover yeah. <laughs> segments. So putting that there for discussion <laughs> for you guys. And then once you guys take a vote, we'll um, move it. So we're talking about the road that is a road that stops and turns to gravel by the moose lines, but before, before, before it's done. Yeah. 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 That's a road. It's a road. Yeah. 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 I'm moving Sounds like everybody thought it was yeah. a road. Yeah. 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 Recommend Cook Avenue to the council as a road for acceptance. Second. Thank you, John. All in favor? Okay. Uh, and the minutes we have are of December 12th. Right on top of New Year thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good to me. Uh, so there's a couple, there was one edit that I already made that um, Devin noted that I didn't have a full second, so I just put that up. Okay. Okay. So Devin second, all in favor? Alright, who made the motion, Ian? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't throw the brewery now, I close for two months. Isn't that a rock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>